Hello and welcome to another episode of the Gritty Hour. I have uh, a returning co-host, my old friend Rich Deval. Welcome back, Rich. Rich has volunteered to co-host tonight because we have a very special guest, John Goldman, Renaissance man, John Goldman. And yeah. I've heard inklings. We're going to learn more about John tonight, but I've heard inklings that you've accomplished just about everything someone can accomplish. <laughs> so welcome to the Gritty Hour, John. Oh, there you go. That says it all. I think it's I have not accomplished about all I can not accomplish. And by the way, I know you know, but I'm not a gold man. I'm a golden. Yeah, he's a golden. My apologies, John. My apologies. Yeah, that's the yeah, first thing I'll edit it out because you know I don't make mistakes after the edit. <laughs> <laughs> that's why I call him the golden boy. The golden yeah. boy. I like it. Maybe that's what I'll call this episode. So tell us a little about yourself, John. Well, <laughs> that's too little. Where, where do you start, right? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Where well, do I... <laughs> before we started recording, we were just having a conversation about Mike Appel and John Hammond. So I know you know a lot of people in the in- entertainment industry, right? Didn't, didn't you just go to a preview of a movie? Maybe we could talk about that first. That yes, I can. We could jump in there. A wonderful preview, and I think. I think we might see, I might have seen a a new Oscar winner, uh, I think for the Best Acting Award, who played Cabrini and the producer and director. Um, The producer is a a dear friend um, and Jonathan Sanger. He produced, uh, his first movie was The Elephant Man and he won the Oscar for that. Right. Mm -hmm. Co-produced many, many, most of, I think, the movies with Mel Brooks. And he did Vanilla Sky, a lot of Tom Cruise movies. And uh, what was the other one? That's a wonderful movie um, on the justice. Uh, well, on, on one of the Pelican first. Brief? No, Cabrini is, was about no, a nun. No, no, Pelican Brief. Was it Pelican Brief, the other one? The no. One? No. No, Douglas, uh, about uh, Marshall, Judge Marshall. Okay. It's oh, one okay. done wonderful movies. But this movie here was just uh, previewed, and uh, I'd seen it earlier at a screening, but this was a more formal thing. And I went with Mike and some other dear friends and uh, and with, with Jonathan, and um, it is the story of Mother Cabrini. I don't know if you know that, and she came here penniless with some other nuns, Mother Cabrini, and uh, they ended up, I mean, there was such poverty, but they came here to try to start with an orphanage, with a hospital, everything. The story's just marvelous. Incidentally, she, when she died, and she was supposed to die like at 30, 35, she was very ill. Every doctor said, do you have a year or two left? She lived till she was 65. It's a miracle. It's impossible. But she ended up, when she died, she had amassed more wealth, not herself, in terms of her entrepreneurship than Rockefeller, than Gates, than anybody. Wow. The wealthiest people, not her. She put it off. She opened up these hospitals. It started in New York. That was the first. And it tells the whole story. It's a beautiful movie. And, and the the first the first hospital was that on Twentieth Street and Second Avenue. I honestly don't know. I don't. Uh, yeah. That might well be. That might well be. Because yeah, that, that that's my old neighborhood, and and actually my sister, my younger sister, not the youngest, but the younger sister, was born in Cabrini Medical Center on Twentieth Street and Third Avenue. Then it probably was that place. So. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> that's, Amazing. Is that is that movie out, uh, John? It will be out uh, now, and I think in March third. Yeah, today. Okay, so, so by the time this airs, it'll be in the theaters. Oh yeah, exactly. It's wonderful. It's yeah. a real story, and uh, yeah, terrific. Um, yeah, okay. they filmed a lot of it in Buffalo, 
And Jonathan now is being called the mayor of Buffalo. <laughs> he embraced him. And I'll tell you another thing about my dear friend. He, uh, Richard understands this, but he was a great, great friend of Red Auerbach's. Now, I'm a big baseball, basketball nut and tennis. I love sports. And uh, he was in the locker room many, many, many times with Kuzi, Russell, Russell. Check. I think Larry, he knew Larry Bird later. But I I love to pick his brain on on stories. And but we talk basketball and baseball all the time. And Jonathan in the process of writing my life story, which I'm so thrilled about. And we're about 85% done with the wow. book. And he does the interviews. And I was so thrilled because I originally thought he might be able to help. Someone wanted I had a lawyer that was very interested in getting it uh he always said, you got to write your life story. You've been through so much. And I'm like, what? <laughs> Me? But, uh, and I still say that because the people in my life deserve so much more attention than I do. And I'm not being humble. It's just the truth. The people I talk about that influenced me that I have a cousin that died, almost died in my arms of cancer. And he was, he's a year older than me. We'd been through everything together every single thing and, and i just say i always said cousin roger one day in his life would probably dwarf my entire life and, mm -hmm. and i'm not kidding he, what he there's just nothing like a character like that he was so unique mm -hmm. but uh i think he ended up teaching me to be harder and i taught him how to be softer in life wow. it's, a, it's a beautiful balance but Oh, but that's have you but have you changed now? I mean, you don't seem like the hard person. No, I'm harder. I oh no, because I was so soft, I think, and he was he was a real tough survivor. I've just got more re, more reality based of you know what's out there, the, the real world. I'm talking about growing, you know, I, I'm gonna be 79, so you know, I, I all those years, I'm I've not, you know, went to I went to summer camp with him. I did everything. We grew up together. Uh mm -hmm. went to the hippie thing, everything, everything together. So, but no, I'm I'm if anything, I I became I think a little bit stronger. And the strength gave me maybe the ability to embrace my softness again, <laughs> my sensitivity, because I okay. feel that way now very much that I you know, I'm I'm um, compassionate more than ever, even toward myself, and more forgiving. But you know, that's time. Time does that, I think. Yeah. Well, yeah. Not, yeah. Right. It, all, it also heals all wounds too. It so. really. It, it does. So well, now somebody is writing a book about your life. I hope it's the book that's eighty-five percent done, not the life. <laughs> but um. Uh, so what were you, so you're 79. What were you doing 50 years ago? I'll be 79 in another, in April 22nd. What was I doing 50 years ago? So you would be 29. I was a singer. That's a great question. At the last year of my career, I was being a singer-songwriter. Oh. And I had left that. When I when my dad died, right around thirty, I always wondered if the reason I needed to be a singer songwriter and express myself was to maybe be able to have the strength to face the death of my father. I don't know why, but what what got, what got you into singer singing and songwriting? And it had to be something. It was about the last song I wrote was when he died. Goodbye, old friend. I'll see you again. It was almost a completion. And it gave me an ability, I think, to accept that loss and 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 then grow from it. Um, what led me to that? I honestly, I, 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 there was nothing I felt I could do with my life that gave me a real satisfaction with spending this unbelievable commodity time right i had time and what am i going to do be a doctor be a lawyer be a 
I, I don't know why I say that, to Jewish upbringing, maybe, you know, <laughs> parents, or that, or go, or go into business like my father, who was yeah. extremely successful, smarter salesman, sold dry goods, but he was, he built an empire. And uh, I had five brothers, five boys, no, no girls, Three miscarriages my mom had, miscarriages in the day, all boys. Would wow. have been eight. Wow. But we ended up with five, a good starting team, four of us all were athletes. <laughs> that was always my dream to go back to this little private school we went to, a Quaker, wonderful Quaker school called Oakwood Friends School. And uh, I was the fourth one that went there. My dream was that we'd all be the starting five on the alumni team. <laughs> was that in Dutchess County? Is that school in in Dutchess? It is. Yes, and oh. I think I still I think I still have a record there, and not a great record, but it's something I did. I think I'm the youngest person that ever started on a varsity basketball team. Wow! Just, look that up. We have to look that up, Thomas. Where, where in Dutchess County? Because yeah, I'm in sitting in Dutchess County as we talk. <laughs> In, in Poughkeepsie, New York? Oh, Poughkeepsie. Okay. That's not too far from here. Yeah. Look it up. I've tried. It's it's a long time. Long long before internet. It was 1960. No, it was 1959. I was just turned 14. Wow. And, and, you, and you started varsity. Wow. Yeah, what, was, was, what, was, what was the final score of that game? Do you remember? No. That's a good question. I can't <laughs> played Millbrook or Pine. Yeah. And the, yeah, so I'm proud of that, you know, but it took me downhill from then. <laughs> As I got older, I, you know, I had a lot of other interests, but I love playing sports. But it led to, when your question was, why did I choose that? Yeah. I went through many things, a, a lot of rebellion. I, I was thrown out of two schools in within six months in my senior year. Congratulations. <laughs> I love it. That's what I'm doing. I feel that way. I just been the best for meetings uh, uh, um, at the Quaker School on a Sunday, and they had a speaker, and he said, and this is my senior year. I only had four or five months left to go, and he said, you got to go out in the world and make your mark, and right? And I'm going, yeah, I'm leaving this school. I, I got to go make my mark, and I I was left with two friends. We we ran away, and that was wow. that. And then my parents begged me to finish school, please. And I said, "Oh, okay." And the principal was a real dick, horrible person, <laughs> the worst principal that lovely Quaker school ever had. Uh, and everyone, he he threw out so many students, and he just said, "No, I don't want them to come back." It was fine. And then I went to a second school called Storm King, where I had another little, my brother was an English teacher and he was the basketball coach, excellent basketball player. And then I went out for basketball, the, their captain got expelled. And then I ended up in that short period being the captain of the team. <laughs> <laughs> and then I was there and enjoyed that. It was fun being with my brother. But then I got caught, I had snuck out and uh, got caught by the police. We went into an empty house that was being built. And I was with a friend with these two townie girls, Marilyn Brower, I remember. Can't believe I just remembered her name. Are we, we going to have to edit this? Oh, I got to I gotta edit that lady's <laughs> name out, you know. <laughs> yeah, good. But uh, we got caught, pant literally pants down in the... <laughs> Pant naked as a jaybird, doing, and uh, so I got thrown out of there, and, and ended up somehow getting uh, uh, graduated because I think my parents begged the the Just get them out, get them out of the school. <laughs> they let me graduate somehow, and uh, yeah, and I, you know, I it's so funny. I I had acceptances with good college. I was a good student. Not that it was easy. I just I'm was totally. Uh, um, what's the word? Uh, I'm even forgetting it when you can't. I can't believe it. Dyslexic? Dyslexic? 
Not dyslexic, the other one where you have 50 things going on at once. Oh, well, it would be like ADHD or something like that. Um, yeah, I still am. But they had no term for it in those oh, days. Yeah. Yeah. It was. And I, I could really do 50 things at once. I mean, it. I, 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 I still can. Yeah. It's easy. One Pers personally, I know. <laughs> <laughs> and once in an interview, I think it was with Billboard that they asked about that, and I said I could, I can do 50 things um, much easier than doing one thing. It's the truth. <laughs> the focus. My mind just does things, and and it's great. I can accomplish a lot that way. It. They say a lot of creative people have that. So, uh, they, what was what was the reason Billboard magazine was intervie interviewing you? Could you tell us a little bit about that? Boy, that's a long time. I think it had to do. It had to do when we were starting our company, Center Field, and I, I'm trying to think of it related possibly to. Uh, when Billboard started documentary, documentary, documenting, um, what do you call new age music, which you're all familiar with, mm -hmm. right. right? It was unheard of then. There was long before Yanni and Andreas Vollenweide, all that. Um, this was the early, early days, but it was starting to sell records. So we put out a record. I was executive producer and I financed it uh, called Latitude with a great old friend of mine, Craig Payton and Ben Verdery. One was a great classical guitarist and the other one played the uh, vibes player, but he, he had something called the Fairlight. I don't know if you know what that is. It was priests and clavier, electronic computer. That It's brilliant. So he put this all together and it's one of my proudest achievements because my children sort of grew up with that, the record. They would go to sleep with it. it and it's it's just, wow. it's, it's so not new age. It's just wonderful music. The real melody, as opposed to new age, is more um, dreamy. This is really holds up. So we ended up being the very first charting Billboard's new age record. Number, I mean, I don't know if it sold ten thousand copies. Honestly, <laughs> it was that was nothing in those days. But no one was so we were number one for the first six weeks of new age music. Wow! And then it became really popular, you right, know. Right. And, yeah, and uh, that 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 the uh, the instrument that you were just talking about. You had told me a story about when you had a uh, a recording studio and you were going to invest in a machine. You yeah. remember too much. Of course <laughs> I do. <laughs> all the Sinclavia, and this was electronic where, you know, oh, it changed everything. Uh, when they did this, you could, the Fairlight cost $15,000. That's what Craig Payton used to do latitude the highest rolls royce for a major studio was called the synclavier that cost two hundred and twenty thousand dollars at that time at, at that time yeah but you <laughs> could do the highest level film scores it was really the state of the art thing my partner my dear partner mike minieri I don't know if you know who that is, Tom, but Mike is a legend in the industry, huge jazz player, but he's worked in every every venue. And um, he kind of really pushed me to, and he was right, we're going to do Hollywood, we're going to do film scores. But I could have done it for either for 15,000. And I know I could now, I think. But that the reason Richard brings it up this is the music industry. It cost me two twenty, and a year later, it was worth fifteen thousand dollars. <laughs> That's the technology, and not didn't make me too happy. Um, <laughs> well, listen, you, you you took it home and you took a loss, and that's it, right? 
I didn't take it home, but we uh, we took a loss. <laughs> right? But um, if, if only they yeah. had eBay back then, you know, you could have thrown it on eBay. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, you know what? You were complaining, and out of that came. Now, I think if we didn't have that, we wouldn't have had a wonderful record. Um, have you ever heard of a movie called The Lost Boys? I believe so. Yes. Legendary movie. It, it's. And now they're going to be doing a sequel, we hear, and I'm thrilled. Oh, wow. We did the theme song for that, and it's legendary. It's it's in, in, an incredible... Um, it's so popular, and there's no description. And uh, the artist was Gerard McMahon, who I managed, and he was actually a partner for a while with Michael and I, and then we managed him, and I did. And... Uh, he and Michael co-wrote the theme song. And I was, kind of a, like, I was just looking up the Lost Boys as you were talking. Is this the one with uh, Donald Sutherland's kid, uh, Kiefer Sutherland? Kiefer, Kiefer, yeah, yeah, yeah. It's a wonderful movie. Yeah. You know, Vampire, et cetera. Not my, this is a lovely, funny, beautiful, you know, it's the ultimate cult movie. It's It really is. Um, a very high-grossing movie for Warner Brothers. Joel Schumacher was the director, and what a wonderful person he was to work with. But uh, I'll tell you a good story on this. Uh, we did the theme song in the studio on our own dime. We just, Gerard had gotten the script, I believe, and we knew they were looking for more music. It was from Warner Brothers, and um, I, oh, what was his name? The head of Warner Brothers, all the music, TV, music, film, um, having a mental block. What a sweetheart of a guy. Um, he brought in Gerard. He said, look, they went back. Gerard had written for many soundtracks before. Richmond High, on and on. And um, um, he, he said, this opportunity is there. And we got it, looked it over, and they started working on, on, on writing a song for it. And it was, um, just share the screen while you're talking about the movie. <laughs> um, and, and it was just, uh, the song they worked on it. We, we used kids singing the chorus. It's one of my, proudest achievements that I was involved in. I didn't write anything, but I was involved in that deeply um, because it's just a magnificent work. It's so innovative. And I don't know anything that's held up for the... This was 1987. I don't know anything that's held up like this. The following we have, they go and see Gerard perform it now to this day. Uh, and the parents go in and bring the kids. I think there's even now grandparents bringing grandkids. Everyone relates to the movie and relates to the song. But here's the story. When we did do it, we knew we discovered something. We were just going to put a song in there. It was magnificent. We flew out to L.A. and met with Joel Schumacher. I think it was Gerard and I. I can't remember if Michael was there. And the head of the music for Warner Brothers. Why I have a mental block is we were partners at one time for a short time on a company with Gerard. And uh, and um, we were there in J Joel's office. I, I don't know if you know who Joel Schumacher is, but he was a terrific director. Yeah. Uh, what a lovely guy. Anyway. He jumped, he hears the first 15 seconds of the song. This is the truth. And Gerard will swear by it. He saw it. He jumped on his desk. And he, that's it. That's it. You can imagine my heart is beating right now to experience that. And, <laughs> oh, you know, and uh, there's important that you hear that. I saw his passion, that he loved it. Uh, it so, we, he decides this has to be the theme song, which I don't have to tell you the difference of publishing everything on the theme song in a film is huge. There was the theme and it was done by um, Ron Daltrey of The Who. 
Roger. And that Roger called you, excuse me, Roger. And he was a very close friend of Gerard's, incidentally. <laughs> Gerard's probably produced four of his albums, his solo albums. And Roger's a great guy, but a great, great friend of Gerard's. He was the theme, and he was singing the ballad, the Elton John ballad, Don't Let the Sun Go Down, right? Don't let, mm -hmm. right? Get mm -hmm. it? Vampires, the sun going down? Mm -hmm. Ballad. We needed, you know, something excited. When you hear it, you'll know right off. It's genius. It really is. Michael and Gerard, and they just came through. They did it. And Gerard's mm -hmm. vocal is extraordinary. So, um, they eventually put Roger, they took him out of being the theme, but I'll give him this. They put him at the closing credits. It was perfect. Don't let, and it's a great version of it, but we were the wow. theme. And when you hear how that starts, the beginning, it, it's magnificent. Anyway, we see the excitement. We go back and I'm pretty new at managing when I bought this, my with finance, the company Centerfield. And uh, I didn't, I, I was certainly a musician and I had, you know, had financed certain different projects like Latitude, different things I've experienced, but I never owned a company like this. This was a complete, everything, publishing management, recording studio. We did hundreds of commercials, major commercials, uh, which we probably should have kept on doing. And Michael wanted to get back into doing jazz. He's such a brilliant artist. And I think that's, we lost that income from the commercials. And then, well, we branched out and did other things. A lot of rap, by the way, that was tough. Made money. Yeah. That was not fun. That was not, that, that almost was the end of the company in a way. Uh, but we realized we had this song, the excitement, and we go back and we start doing the deal. And again, I was pretty new at management. And we start negotiating with the lawyer at Warner Brothers. And she says, you get your points, you get your writers share this, that. I go, great, great. And I'm negotiating for my artists, for my company. I own, we're all in it together. And she says, yes, and then we get the publishing. And then I'm like, oh, excuse me, what was that last thing you said? She said, well, we take the publishing. I go, well, no, I'm not too happy with that. What do you mean? <laughs> nobody gets publishing. Back in that day, guys, nobody did. Nobody I had, did. Thank God I had no idea. And they said, no, you get the rights of the writer's share. Okay, and you get points and you get your money you put in for Recording it, that was all good. I said, yeah, but I don't I don't feel right about that. I, I, there's so much. You you shouldn't get the... They say, I think she said, you know, McCartney, um, Stevie Wonder, nobody gets publishing. You get the opportunity. So I start holding back. And after a month, we're fighting the lawyer. I forget her name. She became, I think, the head legal lawyer at Warner Brothers. Um, and Gerard remained friends with her when he went on to other situations in his career. And, uh, but we battled her and I, after about six weeks, Gerard and Michael and their experience, they're getting so pissed off at me. They're going, John, nobody gets publishing. I I've done it with Richmond Tide and this Michael's done it. You don't do it. And I say, no, I, I don't agree. I think that's not fair. Now, as crazy as I am doing it, risking everything, risking, because we thought they could walk, in the back of my mind, my business mind was one thing. I saw Joel Schumacher jump on a desk <laughs> and go nuts. Yeah. What are they going to do? Go back at some point to the director, the creative man, and say, we had an economic problem. We can't <laughs> buy what you needed. I knew that somewhere. I had that meat on the bone. Right. Wait, we fight. I think it was the second month. They're ready to do shooting everything. No one's talking to me, pretty much. Everyone's pissed. So we finally had this discussion. I forget her name, not Debbie, but I we'll call her Debbie. I can't remember. She was good. She was a good a good uh, competitor. 
And I finally go, and we were hanging up on each other. We were fighting through the, all the thing, and no nope, talking. And I'm doubting myself. And I go, all right, listen, I'm going to give you the skinny. And she goes, yeah. I say, all right. My four-year-old daughter, Joanna, walks around the house singing, thou shalt not kill, thou shalt not harm. 15 seconds, not a word. And then I hear 50 50, and the phone hangs up. I got the 50 50, which after the years, you know, 30 years later, whatever, it really paid off for everybody. Yeah. And I'm grateful to her. But I feel so, I, I mean, I must have, I stooped pretty low <laughs> to go, my daughter. My <laughs> daughter thinks that that is the reason. 50 50. So, Right. But wonderful what I hear Gerard tells me is that changed the paradigm. It opened up publishing. Right. Yeah, you more. got, the, what, you got yeah. Taylor Swift owning everything, right? <laughs> That's the way to go. But artists did start getting publishing <laughs> from film. So if that's all true from what I hear, that, that helped a lot of artists, I hope. Oh, very good. Very yeah. Good. Yeah. Well, now that explains why Billboard wanted to talk to you. Fifty-fifty <laughs> guy. <laughs> no, no, but uh, that was before that. Uh, yeah. So I, we're going back to why did I choose music? It was really at a point in my life questioning everything. Why am I here? And I had gone through being a trying to find something, a purpose. I kept doubting everything. Right. Uh, I, and then along comes the hippie thing. Around <laughs> 90, um, that, that was life-changing. Um, but Woodstock. after... You, we'll skip the hippie thing. He's going to hate ass for everything. I come <laughs> back and said, what am I going to do? What can I do that gives me a feeling that I lived on this earth for some reason. I don't want to sell dry goods, schmatas in the in the in the garment district. All five boys didn't go after to follow my father. Isn't that interesting? Wow. The, what I get all five went different ways. Um and uh that's a whole other story. He just didn't make it attractive. He he, he couldn't help himself, I think. He, he wanted us to learn the way he did, you know, yeah. from being poor and, you know, and you, you can't do that growing up in a house. We grew up on 54 acres, made butler, you know, four swimming pools. You, you don't say you got to go down in, in the basement and, and, and low. It just wasn't right. It wasn't our ego. It just, he, he, it wasn't a way to teach your children. Right. And everyone rebelled. And, um, I always said you were lucky, Dad. You you grew up in the depression. It put it in you. You the hunger. You can't do that. I didn't grow up that way. Not that it was easy. He never gave us anything. We he was always um he always wanted us to sort of fight for it. You know, it wasn't easy. It was very tiny allowance. He used to feel he used to give us jobs. I remember going around the property, honest to God, with my brother picking up rocks. <laughs> I said, I want to clear. This was our job at eight years old, teaching me character. I was picking up rocks. Uh, <laughs> where where were you living back then, John? It's in, it's called. Uh, I was just telling someone uh, in Suffern, New York. Okay. I moved there when I was four years old. In 1949, from Jamaica Estates, and uh, he grew. He he kind of took my poor mother away from my mom should have been a an actress or a politician she's very social and conscious takes her and moves her all the way in rockland county back then it's right. only 30 miles from manhattan but then that was the big a, it's a big difference oh it's pure beauty you know wonderful country it's what i love but it was not where she wanted to be and so she was there with this estate it's the last thing she wanted so it's very tough on her and the school system was really backwards there, pretty redneck, if you ask me. 
And that's why I was lucky I went to private school. Thank God. But um, and she got thrown out twice. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Nice uh, going. Nice going. <laughs> anyway, but that was, again, all part of trying to find something in my life that I could uh, hold on to. So I'd gone through many quitting things. Uh, I was a music mixer, engineer, quit that when I finally got accomplished as a mixer, not an engineer. I went to being an actual music mixer and got a job and then walked away when I was 20 and said, I have a bigger calling. I have to go to Haight-Ashbury. It was the hippie thing. Probably one of the best things I've ever done. But it was doubting everything. Mm. Everything. <laughs> and what are we here for? And uh, I say, I'm no longer a hippie, but it's right here in my eyes. It's still there. Everything there I believed in and still do believe in, you know, want to believe in. <laughs> but you had to go full cycle, hippie to reality, business, take care of a family. But I came back. <clears throat> And tried to go back to school I did very very well went back uh, majored in psychology uh, great A's that's after leaving school the city college quitting going to the hippie thing music engineer apprentice and then coming back and then just stopped everything. And then I just said, I had to write music. And it, it was the thing that I, and I wasn't any kind of great musician. I wasn't a great singer at all, but I had a story to tell. That is true. And I wasn't writing the sky is blue. I love you. I was writing, you know, real stuff. It was therapy. That was another interview. I can't remember. That might've been a local paper about saying, you know, I, I, uh, I had to, um, it was I think I said the therapy bill would have been too high I had to write music and get up and sing it the reason I had to sing it that's what was so hard was I was a songwriter I wasn't interested particularly in singing but it was the only way I could get the songs out Right. was to sing them so I started performing my mom helped me I got vocal lessons from a great opera singer so I wouldn't lose my voice started writing and it was real therapy that's what it was I mean I was into, definitely into like Leonard Cohen Bob Dylan those were my influences it was not pop at all uh, I remember playing at Alice's Alice's restaurant but she had opened another club it was Avalok, I think right by Tanglewood and I remember I would I think I was the first artist there that played there probably before Arlo or he might have been in the earlier club hmm. but I remember she would always go back Alice and go I'd be performing I had this wonderful accompanist Craig Craig Ellis he was terrific to play with anyway she'd always be going like this up up sing up so the people could drink what are you singing <laughs> your mother your father your child and uh, that was not what I was therefore <laughs> <laughs> but it really was the purest thing i had ever done and i could sleep at night and that's where it led to right did all these other things that finally lead to the last decade not not even when i own the music company or real estate other things i've done <laughs> i've never now i have the same clarity and what i do is put people together that's it i love it and it's psychology i guess it's teamwork, get rid of the egos. I like to say in business, and, and Rich is well aware of this, it doesn't matter to me anymore, the business, gold, diamonds, uh, entertainment, film, doesn't matter, anything. It's four things uh, in business that to succeed, it's in this order, it's people, 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 product. And that's it. I've learned this. It's taken a lot of years. That's it. It's all about the people. And if you have one person you trust 100% and they are the real deal, that's the buyer or the seller. You'll always be able to find the other match if you do. You, it gives you the strength to find right. that person. I might add that there are not many people around like Rich. <laughs> Richard's 
uh, terrific to work with. He understands it all. But yeah. um, and that's another show. So, but but <laughs> that one. <laughs> hey, I, I wanted to bring up the uh, the talking baseball, the song, the talking baseball song. Maybe you can tell us that story. Well, okay. That's a wonderful relation I have with Terry Cashman, um, a dear, dear friend. Now, I was involved with an album called Passing It On, Father to Son. Talking Baseball was part of the album. There's some other songs on there that are spectacular. Um, we signed that with Sony Records. And crazy story, we're going to release it in, I think it was 87, right when the horrible strike came out. And it's just, they were going to do a TV marketing. They, I think they, they put in serious money for that, uh, a TV commercial uh, uh, to, to market the record. It was, it's a beautiful record. I always say it's like, it's like, um, what's, what's the uh, New York, the Saturday evening post uh, artist. No, Norman Rockwell. Rockwell. Yeah, we say Terry's work is like the Norman Rockwell of of um, music. It's not schmaltzy. It's beautiful stuff about baseball, and he loves baseball. And he wrote he wrote talking baseball, and so he did this whole. We had eighteen songs on. Long comes the strike, and the story. You you'd pick up the phone and people would hang up on you. Baseball, it was horrible, and and we had. You know, there's some great stories about that, trying to get that. And they were so ready to market it. The timing just wasn't right. And I'm still so proud of that, being involved with, with Terry on that. And and, and one, one wonderful thing, by the way, Rich, I was telling you, Terry got elected to the Hall of Fame. Um, there are only two songs in the Hall of Fame. Put Me In Coach, Centerfield, Fogarty, and now Talking Baseball. Talking Baseball, wow. Mickey and the Duke. Right. And I was there when they elected him. He, I was in the front row in the little stadium behind mm -hmm. Cooperstown. Mm -hmm. And I was with my girlfriend at the time. Um, and he sang it <laughs> right before he got inducted and sang it on the stage with 50 Hall of Famers behind him. Can you believe that? <laughs> you know, me, baseball and music. My company was called Center Fields. Say no more. The Mick was the music and baseball. Anyway, he got elected. He sang that song, and I started crying so hard. I had to literally be walked out like this old I I was hysterical. It was so emotional to see see him up there. I was so proud of him and happy, etc. And uh, yeah. I'm just well, reading the lyrics. I who uh, there's marijuana in this song. <laughs> yeah, he, he's a little out there. <laughs> Not what anymore? You know, the, some of the lyrics on it. Well, uh, I mean, it's just, but but if you if you read it, it's it's actually, and, and you think about that time, at that time. And I and was that the strike year? Was that when the I, I think was it the Montreal Expos? 1981. It was 1981. No, no, this had to be right around our time. It was happening. 87. I think okay. it was. And it, yeah, it was a second strike. Oh, it was everything. It closed down. The, the season closed down, and um, maybe it was the year before. But it just, the marketing was just at the wrong time. But mm -hmm. uh, a great story. I met a lot of players as a, and and I was a, I was a. Tom, I was an insane Brooklyn Dodger fan. I, I slept with my glove. I cried when Newcomb lost to Robin Roberts right before he had 20 wins. I, I just lived. I still do. I'm a Brooklyn major Dodger fan. And uh, and I know my base. I always say I know one or two things in life. I, baseball is the one I know. And I still don't know anything compared to someone like Terry or Gene Orza, 
dear old friend. He was head of the Players Association. Rusty, when he was alive, these guys knew baseball. I know one out of, not one out of a hundred I am. I'm one out of a thousand. I think Terry, Terry always says I was the color man, color boy. <laughs> right. I, I didn't know who batted 238 and batted right. Terry knows that. But I knew how to make a connection, creative ADHD connection. But um, I, I, oh, I knew. So we one time were having dinner and I am getting this chance to meet all these players. We were at the All-Star Game in 87. Terry sang two or three songs at home played at, at Baltimore when they opened the Camden Yard. Camden Yard, okay. Yeah. And uh, I, oh, that was beautiful. And then the night, that night, all the All-Stars were there. And Ken, Ken um, what's his name, the producer, Ken Bates? Not Ken Bates. Who did all the um, Channel 13. Oh, Ken Burns. Ken Burns. He was young. He, his daughter was a child then. She, I think she's a big producer now. He, he was a sweetheart of a guy. But um, And we were hoping we would have Talking Baseball be the theme for the, the baseball series, but it didn't fit. It, it just since, But we're meeting all the all these phenomenal players. And um, <laughs> anyway, we, I had so many players wanted to be involved and be sort of immortalized in Terry's lyrics, right? But he wrote, talk, the original song is Talking Baseball, Willie Mickey and the Duke. Every franchise has a version. Imagine. So you could be in, I, you could be in Baltimore and it might say, instead of Willie, Mickey and the Dukes, right? It might be Boogie, Boog, Boog. Uh, so Ripken, and so Ripken and the... <laughs> yeah. but every version it's amazing <laughs> so I if I remember this correctly we were in New York with Terry I think it was Steve um, Tom, Jim Palmer Rusty maybe Rusty Dick. Stop. La Grande Orange go ahead <laughs> yeah Rusty was like Terry's best friend but I got to know him real well too, a sweetheart. Uh, and a couple other players are having dinners, I think at Sparks, I can't remember, and the Duke. So I'm meeting Duke Snyder. My nickname is Duke. It's up till I was 14 because I threw righty and batted lefty. I taught myself how to do that. He was my <laughs> idol. Truth of the matter, gents, was I was a little pesky Pee Wee Reese. I was a shortstop. <laughs> and I didn't have a strong arm. But I was a shortstop and I wasn't a home run hitter, but that was who I really was, Pee Wee. But a Duke was who I wanted to be. And um, so when we were having dinner, I was talking a lot with Duke because there's the hero of my life and I know everything about the Dodgers and the 54 Dodgers, 55. I, I, I learned my whole education. Math was the back of baseball cards. <laughs> That's how I learned how to do, you know, fractions, one for three. three and I learned everything out of that. And I, I had I had the best baseball card collection in Rockland County by far. Um it's the only thing I ever stole as a child. I stole cards. I can't deny it. I stole. I couldn't. It was an addiction, like an addict. I would, and I would go to keep friends' houses and steal one or two cards. If I saw a, a Stan Musial, I'm sorry. I, I, I would have to steal it. I didn't steal many, but I did steal one or two. <laughs> Statute of <laughs> limitations are yeah. is past anyway. Don't I worry think, about I it. I think we're okay on that one. Yeah. <laughs> Kid, I still would like to give it back. I feel so bad. He went to the bathroom. He was a younger kid than me. And I saw this collection. I saw a Stan Musial. I said, I, I was about nine. And I, I said, I can't control it. I said, <laughs> Wait, my stand man. I go, oh. I mean, he was on the desk. He goes to the bathroom and it's no longer there. And I go, I don't do? get, 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 get But anyway, <laughs> story with Duke and this is he didn't just tell it to me but what I heard what he said was we're I'm I think I was blowing him away because I knew everything Jake Pittler was the coach at first base old Jake Pittler guys didn't know that I I know how to test people when you, you they say they're big fans I'd say you know I'd name a name like who was the first base coach most guys didn't know that or the third base coach anyway 
he says at one point we become, I felt really friendly and because and, I could talk to talk. And uh, at one thing, when he says, you know, it's really great. My father nicknamed me Duke. He said, why Duke? And he said, well, it just doesn't sound right. Willie Mickey and the Edwin. <laughs> great line. And he was, you know, <laughs> terrific yeah. to me. Yeah, I'm glad yeah, you but- told that story, uh, John, because when before you talk about your music label and you, you, the label was called uh, Center Field, right? Or the Center music Field, company. Yeah. yeah, not the label, but yes, it was. A I have studio. to. I have to admit, I the first thing I thought was Mickey Mantle for another team. <laughs> I, I, don't I don't know why I had you pegged for that, but <laughs> now I got to ask you because Rich and I have been on a million baseball teams together. Um, uh, uh, did you translate your uh, allegiance to the Mets after the Dodgers left? No, I'll tell you what I did. Everyone <laughs> hated the Dodgers, you know, all the fans. At that age, I what was I, 13, 14? I swear to you, I said, I don't, it's business. I understand that. <laughs> but when you read the history, you realize that the thing with Moses, I think O'Malley tried to stay here. He really did, and then he did, he left, and he was he was brilliant. But anyway, I always will say, and I say it to this day to people: Were you rooting for Brooklyn or for the Brooklyn Dodgers? Think about it. You were for a team, young Sandy Colfax. Bonus wherever, wherever they go, right? Oh, you were rooting for Brooklyn, the city. Well, good for you. That's what. He didn't leave. The team left, and I followed him all the way. I watched Kofax, Blossom, Drysdale, everyone, Tommy Davis. I loved it. But, it, of course, it was not the same. But, no, I'm still a I'm a Dodger fan. I hate the Yankees. <laughs> I have a dear friend that always asks me, and Dr. Bourne, he always asks me, do you hate the Yankees more than you love the Dodgers? And I still have to think for a second, and I <laughs> No, I'm not even sure. But when they asked me why do I hate them so much, they ruined my childhood. Till 1955, every year they killed me. It was heartbreaking. So, and uh, so that that's. But I love the Red Sox because I because I hate the Yankees so much, <laughs> and I follow baseball, all the American League. Well, now, well, everything. Why? because I love to follow the teams that play the Yankees. So I root for them and I learn about their players because I root so right. hard against the Yankees. But I am. <laughs> anything, yeah. anything against the Yankees. Well, you know what? The, the Dodgers are, are going to be playing the Yankees here in the Bronx, actually. Yeah. Year. And the Yankees have a wonderful team this year. They yeah, look so do the, so the Dodgers. <laughs> they do, yeah, yeah, for sure. Hey, hey, John, I, I wanted to talk about uh, the the Crone project that you're working on uh, hey. as as something uh, maybe we can just kind of touch on. I, you you sent over the the uh, the trailers, and is there an anticipated date on this? No, we're, it's a. It's much bigger than that movie, too. It's it's a movement, we feel. But no, the trailers, no, we're finished. We still want to raise some funds to do some editing and marketing. The movie is basically done. And do some, um, a little stuff with music and, um, yeah. Well, just, but, explain, just explain to our audience what, uh, what you're talking about. Well, it's about menopause. I'll do my best. I wish I wish my um, director was here and his wife, that he's a producer as well. They explain it so much better. And by the way, our producer on this is Jonathan Sanger. I'm an executive producer, and I work with Jonathan on this closely. Uh, and I'm so proud I introduced Jonathan to Dominique and Chris. Um, this is a wonderful project. It's in my heart. It's about menopause, and when women reach menopause, it's like, what do you do? You're not bearing children. You go to Florida and you you play golf or do something. You can. Uh, 
it explores in history when women ran the world. And you were talking thousands of years ago in the tribe, the men would go out. The women, the older women were the wise women of the world. And this is, this is what it's really all about. I think part of this is about wanting to have that happen again and let women run the world. And I, I, I have a lot of feelings toward this. A lot, we have the audience that so many women relate to this and understand it. It's not about women really running the world. It's a, but it probably could be a bit more compassionate if it was a bit more understanding. Um, but it explains the history, how it all started and then why it's very documented. Why, when it changed with hunting and fire, I won't even go into the details. The movie will show you. With all the um, wonderful people they've used, uh, archaeologists, sociologists, doctors, explaining it when the world changed. And it really, it, it, it wants to create a consciousness now, and it's needed now, to at least understand this. And um, it's bringing in many different people, um, entertainers, business people, we feel that are, are attracted to what this is all going to um, be all about and the statement. Um, it is a documentary. I think it's going to be an Academy Award documentary. It's it's wonderful. And uh, the passion we have behind it. But it is much deeper than the movie. It would be probably episodes of women who evolved and, and, and created this, their own um, success. Um, so it could be... A, uh, we're looking at that possibly, you know, 10 uh, net Netflix type shows from the movie. And we're trying to attract wonderful people, some great artists, singers. We, we want to get a great theme song. And um, yeah, it's, it's just very empowering for women and men. My deepest feeling about it is bringing it to and aware men, enlightened men that understand. Right. And, listen. And, and, and the working title of the project is, is called what? Oral and Crone. Okay. Yeah. And um, yeah, I I wish I could explain the history of that better than, but Dominique or Chris could do it even much better than I. But um, it, it kind of used to be, people think of it as a witch, Crone. And it was once a very revered term, and we wanted to keep it that way. It's mm -hmm. it's a, you know sort of untarnish it and make it shine. And the word chrome, yeah, right, right, right. Got mm -hmm. some wonderful, wonderful grassroots. You know how I look at at this. It's more like a we are the world, uh, or or farm. What was the farm one? The um, Willie yeah. Nelson. One? Oh, oh uh, uh, farm eight. Yeah, farm. Farm this is grassroots. We want this to really be in the heart and soul of people. I'm very proud to be involved in this. Well, we'll be looking forward to that. Uh, and John, mm -hmm. we certainly appreciate you coming on. But I, I have to ask you one question that Rich during the week had told me about. I can't remember if this is on the we could talk about it list or not. Uh, tell <laughs> us a little bit about Sandy Koufax. I, I have to ask you. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't know Sandy. Oh, you don't know. What were you thinking, Rich? I I, I adore him. And no, uh, the the uh, the, uh, the 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 adoption thing with him. Oh, I'm not an expert. Yeah, that's just. Uh, oh yeah, that I, as far as I know, Sandy was adopted. You know the whole Jewish thing. He was adopted. I don't know if he was Jewish or not. I don't kind of think he was necessarily. I don't know. Kind of looks it, but but he was adopted. I think that's what Rich was referring yeah. to. Oh, okay. Yeah. That's interesting. And it is, yes. Yeah. And and especially that he honored the Sabbath and did that. And I, I consider him one of the most dignified sports athletes ever. Yeah. You know who else I love? Djokovic. There's a man I have character. Oh. I, I just good. his character. What do you yeah. think of Ed Crample, John? <laughs> <laughs> A long time. I'll tell you that, right? 19 years or something. Yeah. I'm told him and uh, Ron Swoboda are opening a uh, 
a restaurant <laughs> in Long Island coming up in June of 2024, if you can believe it. You're joking. No, I heard it. I read it yeah. in the paper. So I read yeah. it somewhere. Egg, no, Egg I, Crample and Ron Swoboda. Oh, that's yeah. perfect. Yeah. Ron, wow. And where's yeah. Marvelous Arm? Yeah, who Marvelous knows? Marvelous Arm. Yeah. <laughs> Those well, mm -hmm. that's where Rich and I are diehard Mets fans uh, for a long yeah. time. So the way you are with the Dodgers, we were with the. Are you an LA Dodger fan, John? Of course, yeah. Okay, I am. but not. Right. The, but yeah, absolutely, absolutely. But Tom, you, you've got an, a Boston accent, right, Massachusetts? Yeah, people tell me that all the time. I'm born and raised in the in the Bronx. Forget <laughs> about it. Yeah, yeah. We all yeah. grew up in the Bronx. That's so, amazing. That's wonderful. I have an old-fashioned New York accent, I think, is what it comes down to. I guess so. But yeah. you, no, that's pretty neat. You know, I'm up in Dutchess County, and I get a lot of, I'm in a retail store here in Millbrook, New York, and I get a lot of people from yeah. from different areas that come into the store, and they all think I have a Boston accent. Really? I have to tell them it's <laughs> in a... Mill, Millbrook High, Millbrook High School, the private school. Do I yeah. know it? Yeah, yeah. Rich's Milbrook. son, Rich's son works at it. Works there, man. Right. Millbrook. Yeah, Millbrook Prep. I scored some points against Millbrook, but I also remember Millbrook with a lot of uh, psychedelic memories of Millbrook. With Just down the block from where I'm sitting, John, you would have loved it here. Then it's a Timothy <laughs> Leary's uh, headquarters. <laughs> That's the truth. That's the truth. <laughs> Now you're, now you're talking. <laughs> as soon as you dropped out, you landed in his joint down there. Yeah. They've been trying to live it down ever since. But... You asked me not to talk about that. Come on. Oh, he did? Well, he brought it up. Well, you know. yeah. I'm still waiting to get sued by the by the lawyer from uh, Warner Brothers, whatever the hell he's talking about. <laughs> but it was a great pleasure. You, you are a renaissance man, uh, John. I think I will title this something like that. But... Uh, I hope it, any of it made sense. It's your, it just, I know this, it felt very comfortable. Thank you both so much for that. Yeah, yeah you're, you're, it was a great a pleasure. Person. You're a great person. Yeah, and I appreciate uh, Rich uh, for, for bringing, uh, co-hosting tonight and having John yeah. come on. It was a great pleasure having you both on the show. So All I right. hope you have a great night. John, when the Chrome comes out, we'd like to have you back and uh, and talk about it when it's, when it's in the theaters. <laughs> An honor. You yeah. bet. No, that's All right. All right, man. Have a great evening, okay? Thank you both.